this we're live streaming so I need to make you aware we are live streaming so questions or anything will be picked up and go out on the live stream so just be aware of that I'd, the live stream will pick up John but it won't actually pick up you on camera but it will pick up your questions afterwards anything on the mic so just be aware of that you're all very welcome it's good to see a great turnout um, it's a number of has we're not expecting a fire alarm if there's a fire alarm we do need to evacuate the building so it's exit through the way you came and there are two other exits on the side um, tweet by all means continue to tweet to two handles and um, the hashtag is um, here at gate at food tinkers and at food policy is the handle at food policy city is the handle so continue to tweet um, we welcome that if you want to put questions up to John by tweeting if you don't want to ask them you can do that we'll keep an eye on some of the questions um, there's Wi-Fi in the room the passwords are up there if you want to log into city Wi-Fi you can log in um, feel free to do that Let's save some of your your um, bills and it's my pleasure to introduce John Coveney um, I'm probably the wrong person to introduce John because I'm John's number one fan actually so it's a really bad situation to be introducing somebody you've admired for years and worked with I've been lucky enough to work with John and John's one of these people who thinks outside the box his his, his background is interesting can I share your background why not he was a printer initially and he worked in this area of London London in the print works and then went off and done a nutrition degree um, worked in New Guinea went to Australia he's probably the only person I know who's a true cockney <laughs> when he comes to London he goes to the um, to the to the to the tube office and says how do I get to Oxford Circus and they look at him and say you're kidding me mate aren't you <laughs> with his accent you will pick up the cockney but John's a real star in the area of food and nutrition he thinks outside the box that's what he does um, he's got a new appointment can I call I have to look well, at it to call right. out your new appointment he's professor of global food culture and health I mean that just basically is everything to do with food <laughs> isn't it um, and that probably reflects his if you look at his publication list on his website it's amazing I think it was 250 I counted at the last oh, count yeah. something like 20 books he's like he's a bit like Tim Lang it's bloody disgusting people are just so prolific but it's my real pleasure to welcome John I think he's going to challenge us on some of the issues I'm going to just hand over to you and Thank you're going you to talk asking. for 35 minutes yeah, then we yeah. have break for and questions. Lots of time for questions. questions thank you very much for that and uh, good afternoon good evening everybody um, back home, one would normally at this point pay regards to the traditional owners of the land. Where I come from Adelaide, that would be the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains, and you would pay respects to their elders past and present, and I'm not able to do that here. Although I might pay respects to the tribal elders within this space, um, people like Martin, people like Tim, people like Karina, people like David Barling, who have been absolute inspirations uh, for me in, in a lot of my work. And a lot of this started years ago when I had a sabbatical back here in the UK and I was lucky enough to have um, an invitation to be hosted with the centre when it was at Thames Valley University. And I was there for three weeks. And I shall never forget it. Um, Tim said to me um, when he was lining it up, you know, what do you need, John? I said, well, just an office will be fine. And I heard this sort of snigger at the end of the phone. And when I got to Thames Valley, I realised what was funny about it because Tim's office was actually the broom cupboard. And uh, he, shared that. <laughs> he shared that office with somebody else. And Martin and David were in a corridor. So to actually have put on the table that I wanted an office all of my own just was completely, completely ridiculous. Um, and uh, as a memento of my time there, I remember Tim came to me and he said, John, it's just been an absolute pleasure to have hosted you. And here's, a, I've got this little present for you. And I've kept this present today. Right, to, it's one of these, these very haughty little things that you go and hand your business cards in. And the gold plating has worn off, Martin. So next time you order this round, you must tell them to use 24 karat gold and not some cheap, uh, imitation. But then they escaped. They ran away from Thames Valley University to City University. And I thought, well, they're not going to get shot of me. So I followed them here. 
and um, here I am today, still uh, in wonderment of the terrific things that happen in this university because of these people. So thank you very much for hosting me and thank you very much for inviting me. So what I want to talk about is some work that we've done around the area of food and trust. Um, it's work that's been ongoing with me and my group for probably 10 years and it's developed and it's expanded and in some ways it's kind of contracted to focus on the things that we think are important. So I'll talk to you about that. But you know, there's no gig that's worth its sort if there isn't a quiz at the beginning. And there's a quiz for this gig. So here we go. Here's the quiz. Imagine that there's a food scare involving chicken in Australia. Which of the following groups is the public most likely to trust to tell the truth about the situation? So, who we got at the front here? We've got Jack, Monica, Ellen, no, Jack, Holly, Monica, Ellen, and Gavin. What do you reckon? Pol politicians? No? How many people think politicians would be the most trusted to tell the truth under these circumstances? No. All right, how about the media? No. Okay. Well, how about farmers? About the same. What about supermarket chains? This few. Okay, you guys, you're pretty good. So this was uh, over a thousand people who had been polled in a study that we did, and this was part of that study, and it was actually farmers came out nearly 40 percent. <clears throat> very, very interesting because if you compare that to a very similar set of studies, how do we do this? So there has been a study running across Europe in Norway, Denmark, UK, Portugal, uh, Italy and Germany and uh, the Australian scene shows that farmers are much more likely to be trusted than farmers in those jurisdictions. And I think it says something about the way that trust is very contextually bound. In Australia we have a love affair with the rural sector. We love farmers. Although we live on the edge of the country, we gaze back into the middle of the country and we long for that kind of rural connection. So that might be one of the reasons why in Australia people trust farmers um, and why that might not be the case in other jurisdictions. But okay, let's move on. Did you know that some young people in Australia actively take risks with food safety? Susan said in an interview that we had, I knew I was getting myself into food poisoning, but it was the romance of having a curry in Brick Lane. So she's talking about this in Adelaide, and it was cheap. Daniel said, we found a maggot in our rice, and it didn't bother me in the slightest. I just kept eating, and I wasn't sick. He then went on to say, I just closed my eyes and opened my mouth. Isn't that perfect? That's actually the title of a paper that we wrote on the basis of that particular statement. Did you know that during their pregnancy, some Australian women are very poorly informed about food safety issues, especially listeriosis. <clears throat> the doctor really did not say anything about food safety, she told us in one study, and neither did my obstetrician. A um, number of people believe that all you need to do to reduce your listeriosis exposure was to not eat the first slice of salami or spam or whatever it was, discard that, and the rest is perfectly fine. Did you know that many people whose second language is English, whose first language is in English, are very poorly informed? Uh, I don't usually speak to the doctors because they're English speaking. I don't understand at all. The doctors don't have the time to go and tell you what you need to eat. They're far too busy. Did you know that rural consumers in Australia are much more likely to question the need for food regulation. This was a study we did. Sometimes I really do think that our regulations, that we are over-regulated with safety because little kids are not going to have the chance to be immune. Common sense seems to have gone right out the window. We have to do little food handling courses now, whereas once upon a time you could run a casserole luncheon and have everybody come. There are, that was our rural component. People lived in the city, on the other hand, thought, no, you really do need a lot of uh, regulation. 
Well, I trust them to put the policy in place, but how far those policies and procedures are followed, I really don't know. They can do all the guidelines in the world that they want, but they've got to have people out there to enforce it. So it was really interesting to talk to people who were further up the food chain, quite close to food production, who thought, what is going on here? We know, we're very connected, we know you don't need all these rules and regulations, and people who are further down the food chain who are very disconnected, saying we do need these rules and regulations to help us keep the food safe. Many, many consumers in Australia do not know who's responsible for food regulation, food safety. I'm aware that there's somebody out there doing something, but I couldn't tell you their name. You'd think there's a government department, but I don't know, it's so hidden. Blah, blah, blah. The actual agency is called Food Standards Australia and New Zealand. So we have a regulatory authority that covers both New Zealand and Australia. So how do we know all this stuff? We know all that stuff because we had a grant from the government, um, Australian Research Council, and we carried out those, um, those studies under that grant using a methodology that actually came from Europe um, with Uni Carahans and Christian Pope. So this was a, a fifth framework funded study that went over about three or four years in Europe. I think it was around about the year 2000. So we used their methodology to compare and contrast our results. And we looked at many, many factors involved in, in food and trust. As you've, I've indicated, we looked at rural areas compared to metro areas. We looked at high income areas compared to low income areas. We spoke to non-English speaking communities. We spoke to pregnant women. We spoke to youth. We spoke to faith based populations where having trust in the food supply was really important if you were going to continue to eat halal or kosher. Um, so we looked at this from an empirical perspective. We looked at it from a theoretical perspective. We had a large computer assisted um, study that we, that, we, that, we, that we undertook, over a thousand people. So, you know, we had some really rich data and we had some really good outcomes. So here's some of the work we've published so far, all in peer-reviewed journals. Some more there. Some more there. I'm showing off. Some more there. Some more there. And some more there. So we had over 36 peer review publications, two book chapters, two PhD theses, two honours theses. It's been terrific. But we're still left with questions. We know so much, and the more you know, the more you realise there's a lot you don't know. So we moved on. What next? And sifting through all of that stuff, we realised there were three main actor groups whose names get coming up again and again as really, really important in this particular space. Who were they? It was the media, it was the food industry, and it was the food regulators. The media kept coming up because we would say to people, where do you get information about food risk and things like that, food scares? Now, so we read it in the paper or we see it on the television. And then later we would say to them, so what do you think about the way the media reports those kinds of, is, oh, well, they exaggerate them because they, they're good news. So it was a really interesting comparison. They, they, got that, they got their information from that source, but they didn't really trust it all the time. Food industry came up for all the usual reasons. Responsibility for food safety is resting largely with them, and similarly for food regulators. So we, we, we pulled together a, a study which we called Trust Makers, breakers and brokers, because each of these groups has the opportunity to make trust and break trust and broker trust. And this was another study that was funded by um, the Australian Research Council, and this was where we brought in people from other countries. So we had um, Flinders University, where I work, Food Standards Australia New Zealand, I mentioned them, uh, South Australian Health Department, we had City University through Martin, we had the University of Kent through Michael Cowman. And here's the person who pulled this off for us, uh, Annabel Wilson. I pay homage to Annabel. She was just terrific. She was our program manager through all of this. So what did we try to do? We wanted to explore the role of the media, consumer organisations, the food industry and public relations and food regulators in developing and maintaining and rebuilding trust in food 
in the food system during times of food scare. Essentially, what we wanted to do was to look at models of trust rebuilding, models of trust maintenance, and models of trust repair. Is there a way in which you can come up with a protocol that you use when there has been a food scare or a food scandal? Are there some ways in which you can say, okay, this has happened, and these things will happen, they'll continue to happen. Are there some things that you can put in place that you say, okay, this is what we do first, this is what we do next, and this is what we do after that. So that was what we were interested in. So we went and spoke to people in these different groups. In the media, we, we spoke to people working in newspapers, television, radio, online. That was both here in this country and in Australia and New Zealand. Similarly, we spoke with people from the different regulatory sectors, food policy development, standard setting, inspection and enforcement. And of course, we spoke to people in the food industry. And instead of just going asking them about, you know, their experience of, we put up a case study. We used this scenario. The case study was that there was a large food manufacturer that identified contaminated soy protein isolate during a routine testing of raw ingredients. The source of the contaminated soy isolate was actually from an Asian country. Soy protein isolates are used extensively in the food system, as you probably know. They're used in a wide range of foods. They're used in drinks. Uh, they're consumed across all, all ages and social uh, groups. They're used extensively in infant formulas. Subsequent testing had identified that contaminated soy protein was in leading brands of infant, manu infant formulas and breakfast cereals, breads, and other products that are commonly sold and currently on sale, and it gets worse. The contaminated product is potentially hepatogenic. It destroys the liver. And the literature suggests that the toxin can be fatal in vulnerable groups, such as children, pregnant women, and older people. So we fashioned this particular scenario, and we took it out to those three groups. And we asked them about this scenario, but we didn't ask the same questions of each group. So for, let me go back to this, sorry. So we spoke with uh, 33 media actors, 30 industry actors, uh, and 42 food regulator actors. So it's, you know, it's a reasonable sample of people there. So for the media people, we said, um, would this story be newsworthy? Well, what do you think they said? This is a gift for anybody working in that area. Something like this is, it, it creates... It's mouthwateringly current. So, you know, they thought this was great. Would you run this story? Of course. How would you run it? So we asked them these kinds of questions. For the food industry, a different set of questions. Do you think that this was a likely scenario? It turned out that in Australia, something very similar had happened a few years earlier. That's where we took the case study from. What will be the salient features? So we asked them those kinds of questions. And for the food regulators, Kind of these, these questions as well. To what extent is this a realistic scenario? Um, is it going to be a significant uh, issue for the company concerned, etc.? So we did these interviews and we collected the data and we distilled the data. And we were particularly interested in what people said needed to happen in order to regain trust in the food supply after a scenario like this. And what we did was we distilled the information we had down to what we called 10 strategy statements. Strategy statements are things that people would do, okay, in order to rebuild consumer trust in the food supply. So we did that piece of work, and then we found those strategy statements that I'll talk about shortly, and then we sent them back to the people who had spoken to us and said, we've taken the information that you and others gave us and we have reduced it to these strategy statements about how to real build trust in the food supply. D tell us what you think about that. Tell us what you think we've done with the data. Do you think that that's a, a reasonable thing to do? So the strategy statements were you need to be transparent, you need to be credible, you need to be proactive, you need to put consumers first, 
You need to have protocols and procedures already in place. You need to collaborate with stakeholders. You need to be consistent. You need to educate stakeholders and consumers, build your reputation, and keep your promises. So these were the things that we distilled. And then we sent them back out, and we asked people to rank them. Rank them in terms of you, what you think is important here. So, uh -huh. so the highest ranking was this idea of transparency. Be transparent. The next one was to have protocols and procedures in place. You can read them there, all the way down. And then what we did was we, we took each of those strategy statements and from the work that we'd done with them, we created um, narratives that each of them could follow under this particular statement. So, for example, for the media and for the food industry and for the food regulators, under Be Transparent, what would you do if you were the media? You'd cite information sources. You'd present a balanced story, not to, you know, try not to frighten the public. If you were in the food industry context, what would you do? You'd communicate with consumers. You'd inform consumers about what's been happening. If you're in the food regulatory um, context, what would you do? You'd report to consumers what is being done to ensure the food is safe. Respond immediately to consumers' um, queries. So we did this for each of the strategy statements. We contextualized them for the media and for the food industry and for the food regulators. So this is a process called member checking. Okay, we're checking back with our members. And again, we asked them what they thought about the way that we were, from what they told us earlier, for the earlier data, what we had distilled in terms of action. And we'd be credible, be proactive, put consumers first, collaborate with stakeholders, be consistent, educate stakeholders and consumers. So the same sorts of things. Build your reputation and keep your promises. But going back through the, 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 the strategy statements, we actually thought that there were too many of them. And what we did was we used the last five and built them into the first five. So what we had here was really five strategy statements because our belief was if we had something like that, there was a good chance that if you were going to put them into practice, five would be an easier group to manage than ten. And then we created a heuristic. You know, what does this look like in, in model form? I don't know why I could, Siobhan, I, I thought, keep on, it's that I have to do. So here's kind of what that looks like. At the centre was transparency. That seemed to be the thing that everybody said was a really, really important thing to focus on when there's been a food scare, and this is a good way of rebuilding trust in the food supply. Be transparent. And then around that were these other major strategy statements. Protocols, be proactive, collaborate with stakeholders, uh, consider consumers. And all of that, we said, would influence your reputation. That's how you would build your reputation if you had in place those particular elements. And around what, what we meant by each of those um, strategy statements is repeated there. So that's the work we did with the, the industry, whether it was the media or the food industry or food regulators. And that seemed to be quite satisfying, but there's a big gap here. Because if we're trying to reconcile with food consumers how to rebuild trust, we haven't spoken to them yet. So that's actually the next part of the study. So develop a more coherent model and then take that back to consumers and say to them, well, if there has been a food scare and a food scandal, we've been told that transparency is really important to gain your trust in the food supply. We've been told that um, consumer considerations are really important to gain your trust in the food supply. We were told that having protocols and programs in place were really important to gain your trust. So this is kind of closing the loop. So that's the next piece of work that we'll be doing. We've got some funding for that and we're going to be testing these models with consumers. And we'll also be testing it hopefully with food scares and food scandals, some of which have been managed very well 
and some of which haven't been married, managed very well. So, for example, in Australia at the moment, um, nobody eats rock melon. I think you call it cantaloupe here. Is that right? Why? Because three weeks ago there was a scare that rock melon was the source of listeria, which was proved to be the case, and two people died of listeriosis. So nobody now in Australia eats rock melon. And if you look at how that process was actually investigated, it was pretty well done. You know, people were alerted very quickly that there's been a listeria outbreak, um, looking at how they're going to manage that, how they're going to find the source. If you looked at that, that was pretty solid stuff. And I would call that, a reason, even though two people died, a reasonably successful way of managing a particular scare, a particular scandal. Quite unlike a situation we had a few years earlier where there was a problem with some processed meat and we just, the public just could not get good, solid information from the regulators or from the food industry itself, which meant that the media actually had a field day because they could basically make up the stories based on whatever people thought the problem was because there was nothing really coming from source. Okay, So that was handled very badly. So we're hoping that our next round will give us an insight into whether what we think is a useful protocol, a useful way of going about uh, rebuilding food trust is actually the case. I mean, I've got one more slide. So can you can you actually build models of best practice in this space? We know that you can do that in, in other areas, in other emergency areas. Um, this is what you do first, this is what you do second, this is what you do third. Can you do it for something like this? Or is it the case that breaches of food trust are so contextual that what works under one set of circumstances would simply be ineffective under other circumstances? So that's the kind of work that we are hoping to do next. Um, and a kind of, I was going to call this food policy in an age of risk, but I think we know how to deal with risk. You know, we've got HACCP and uh, um, various protocols that keep things less risky. I think the problem we have with our food supply and many other areas is the problem of doubt. Because while you can manage risk, what you can't manage is the shadow of doubt that follows cases where there has been a food scare or a food scandal. You know, you, that's a very, very difficult thing to manage, this idea of doubt. And it's become even part of the discourse of science. You know, science as a body of knowledge now has shadows of doubt. About it. I was listening to a very interesting podcast about Andrew Wakefield and the relationship between um, measles, mumps, rubella, MMR, and autism, and how that chimed with some of the problems that happened earlier with the food supply, you know, the uh, mad cow disease and all of that, and how all of that builds up into a big shadow of doubt about authority and medicine and science. And that's really, really hard stuff because people remember, and that's what doubt is. I used to think that risk and trust were the opposite of each other. I don't think that anymore. I think risk, oh, sorry, I think trust and doubt are the things that are on different sides of the coin. I think we can manage risk. Dusk is, doubt is so much... Doubt is so much more difficult because it's something that just lurks even when the risk has disappeared. And here are the people that we've been working with. I want to pay respect to all of those people, Julie Henderson, Ann Taylor, Paul Ward, Samantha Meyer, Trevor Webb, Faye Jenkins, Dean McCullum, Martin Carraher, thank you Martin, Michael Canahan, Callahan, um, Sue Lloyd, Sean Cowlan, Annabelle Wilson, Emma Tonkin, Liz House, L Louise Holmberg, Lurie Mamero, Jamal Neth, and Auntie Layla, all great people, all part of the team. Thank you very much indeed.
How are we doing, Martin? Time for questions, yeah? Great. which we'll pass around and if you can say just who you are and then lobby a question or a comment to John. Um, I'll collect two or three questions first, um, hopefully there'll be lots of questions and then we'll let John respond. Here, here. Hi and thank you. Um, I'm Tony Lewis, I head policy for the Charleston Institute of Environmental Health. Um, professionally I'm an environmental health officer, I'm a regulator if you like. Um, you, you raise the issue of managing doubt, and mm. I think that, for me, really does resonate. Um, I think if you want to look at a, a classic case um, that's, owned, that's still running around, in, certainly in the UK, it involved Russell Humes, it surfaced in January, it went into February, it's still running around, there's probably a legal case somewhere uh, in, in the background, but it is a classic case of how not to manage um, a food incident. What was the food? Tony, is it? Yes. What Tony. was the food incident? Um, what we got, well, that's part of the problem because the, the Food Standards Agency in the UK has never come, come clean so far on the extent of the problem. We know it's meat. Um, there are allegations are, around meat being taken out of cold store, they've been in long term cold store, uh, being cut, being revac packed, and then put back into the market with different, uh, with inappropriate use-by dates. Mm. And the questions then that come with VAC packing uh, and, and a whole s series of other issues that run around it. I th I, I'm having to be careful what I say around some of this. Um, but um, the, the, the point is that, that the FS, the Food Standards Agency in the UK, shrouded it in the cloud, and deliberately so. They gave very little out to, um, to the public. The media were all over it like a rash, and anything that did come out, the media dragged out. How interesting. Wow. Um, and where that's taken us to, from a professional point of view, is a massive amount of doubt. Mm. But what I then go on to look at and say, well, what was the consumer's reaction? Mm. And I have to say, I start to conclude the consumer didn't give a damn. Mm. Um, and the consumer didn't give a damn for, the, for one key reason, and that is meat is food, it is necessary, a price point is critical, and if they were getting um, um, food at the right price, mm. then some of this we can mm. Sort of mm. shroud it in this. I open my mouth and close my eyes. Exactly. <laughs> so, sorry, not so much no, a no, question, no, no, no. but I'm offering Russell Hume to you yeah. as, a, as a current case study that may well fit nicely into that. Well, I remember um, reading... Um, a case when the mad cow disease um, issue was running here and um, there'd been some kind of scare and, and meat was staying on the shelves of, of supermarkets. Yeah. So naturally what they did was to reduce the price and the meat walked. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. You know, as soon as the price came down, yeah. who gives us stuff about risk? You know, let's get on with life as we yeah. know it. Yeah. Very interesting. Thank you. But, but I'm surprised that the Food Standards Agency haven't played a role here because I must say this idea of being honest and having transparency was so key to that study that we did. It just seemed to really be front and centre. Now it may be difficult to be transparent um, all the time. They say, they say there are two things that you should never, no one should ever be forced to witness. One is the making of government policy and the other is the making of sausages. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want to be clear, I'm not saying that they were not around and involved, but well, they were not up front. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I can accept that if there's a legal case that may well follow this. So what they can say, they have to be careful what they say so as not to prejudice the outcome of that legal but case. they would have but, their own legal yeah. people who can take care of all of that. Yeah. I mean, like our Fazans, they have a legal team that check everything that's going out to the public to make sure that there will be no repercussions from the facts that they are delivering. I'm not saying Fazans have got it right all the yeah. time. It's not true. But they've got, a, they've got a team that can help them, and I'm surprised that that's good, because they would learn that if you don't, if, if, if the Food Standards Agency doesn't put facts out there, the media will. And that's exactly what we found. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Thanks very much for your talk. 
Um, I'm probably confusing. Oh, I'm Mary. I'm the coordinator of the Food Research Collaboration here at City Centre for Food Policy. When we're talking about trust, so this is specifically for trust in situations of some kind of event that's happened. Um, but so I was kind of wondering, I mean, I, I can, what, what is the purpose of having to have that trust? Um, and also sort of beyond that, should, should we really be trusting the food industry, um, the regulators yeah. and, and the media? So I'm trying to get my head yeah. around that a bit. It's a really interesting question because it's the question that's often put to us when we have applied for funding. <laughs> so, so what's the benefit of having trust in the food supply? You know, what are, what are the benefits of that? Um, there are some health benefits. It turns out that people who don't trust the food supply are much more likely to eat foods that um, are not nutritious. They're often likely to take whole food groups out of their, their diets, often for quite a long time. They often, um, you know, take up dietary habits that are quite marginal. And there, there's some good data around that. So people who don't trust the food supply are more likely to practice risky behaviour for want of a better word. That, that's one of the things. The other problem is, you know, our food supply is something we have to deal with, we've got to manage it. It's something that in, in the end we do have to invest some degree of confidence in, you know. We've got to, because, because we don't grow our own food these days, well most of us don't, we've got to invest some kind of confidence in where our food comes from. And like if it's the case that you're worried constantly about where, the food, where your food is coming from, there are better things to do in the day. So it's much easier for life generally if you know what the, you know, the quality of your food is like. It reminds me of some of my students who come to us from Indonesia. And of course back home, they don't have to worry about anything. Everything is halal. Absolutely everything. They don't have to But they come to Adelaide and now everything is questioned. They have to look and see whether this food is going to pass muster. They have to look and see whether this food has been, you know, been confirmed or certified to be halal. And life for them is really hard, you know. So I suppose I'm trying to answer the question by saying it's important that we have trust it so we don't have to worry about that. But it's also, it also has some health consequences in that we know that people who less trust the food supply are more likely to have risky eating behaviours. There's some good information out there on that. Yeah. Hi, my name's Anna from, um, <coughs> excuse me, Consumers International. Um, I wanted to ask from you about the, from Consumers International. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about the role of consumer organisations. I noticed that you had them in the yeah. category of trust makers. Yeah. Yeah. They're under food industry. Yeah, and we didn't. Uh, that was uh, that was an oversight. Well, it wasn't an oversight. We didn't take that information to those particular groups, but they will be part of the next study that we do where we're talking to consumers and consumer organisations. So no, they weren't part of that, that particular study. They will be fed into the next leg of the study where we'll be taking that model and saying to consumer organisations and consumer groups and consumers, this is what we've been told by the industry, by food regulators and medias, this is what we've been told would be the best way of rebuilding trust in the food supply. What do you think? So I hope to be able to come back and tell you how we go with that. But um, I, I guess my question was, I, I, did you classify them as food makers? As yeah, we, trust makers we did. We did. Rather than well, trust breakers, well, well, we had them as food makers because, well, we had them as food maker, trust makers and trust breakers because occasionally um, we have um, consumer groups who sometimes blow the whistle and by trust, mate, by trust breakers, I don't mean that they're his, hysterical or anything like that. They just happen to have broken the news that this has, development has happened and, uh, you know, it breaks trust in the food supply. So we did have them as makers and breakers. They're makers because they're often important in actually saying, well, actually, if you do this and you do this and you do this, you've lowered the risk. You know, so um, that's how we would do that. Thanks. I think it was kind of answered by that question, but I mean, I was thinking yeah, you're going to be exploring risk perceptions of consumers, um, yeah. because for me, 
doubt, as you say, that trust and doubt is the two sides of the same coin. But what do you think about that? Do you think well, that's I would think that type? doubt is um, is perception of risk, and that risk is still lays lays somewhere. Yeah. Um, and that might not necessarily be um, as a result of a scare or a scandal as such, but maybe some longer term mm. uh, risk perception mm. and doubt over particular food production methods mm. or um, certain types of food, um, nutritional content, mm. those kind of things. Mm. Um, people will have their different risk perceptions of mm. those, and, and I suppose that feeds into doubt. Um, so I was just wondering if there's any kind of lot. Rather than food scares or scandals, as you say, the kind of the horse meats or the sort of mm. E. coli outbreaks and stuff like that, that's some of that longer term mm. sort of dietary mm. misperceptions or, mm. or food well, production methods. So what, one of the things we did when we were uh, asking people to rank those strategy statements, we asked them to rank them <coughs> under the, um, the condition that there had been a, sco a food scare. Um, I may have had this on one of my slides. And normally... You know, what, what would you generally tell people, you know, to maintain um, trust in the food supply? And hardly any of those strategy statements changed. Transparency was still number one. Be proactive was still number two. Have protocol and uh, policy uh, measures were still number three. So I don't think it was, I don't think people thought, oh, well, under normal circumstances, we would do this. But if it was really important, we, it seemed that people were thinking that, look, transparency, number one, proactive, number two, was the same for each category. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Gavin from uh, City of... Uh, Centre for Food Policy, doing a master's degree. Um, you say that trust and doubt are the two sides of the coin, but I was just reflecting on how we're just seeing with Cambridge Analytica how trust and doubt have very much been engineered in social media and the, you know in terms of elections. You know they've, they've engineered doubt and Absolutely. fear, yeah. and then they've created trust in yeah. other political yeah. parties by yeah. doing that. Um, and I was just wondering that social media in that area didn't seem to feature in the research and if that's something you touched on yeah um not in this research this research was carried out when social media wasn't really having the running that it's using that it is today but we've just done a study with um the island of ireland the whole of ireland through an organization called safe food which is responsible for um <coughs> Food policy, food regulation, food programs. Cross border. And right it, across. It's an EU funded yeah. under the peace agreement. And so we ran a very similar methodology. And one of the things that's come out of that is that social media is extremely important in getting information out, you know, to alerting consumers that, you know, this has happened. Um, but. It's also extremely effective in raising doubt in people's minds because anybody can use it. Anybody can put up a blog. You don't need any qualifications to be able to do that. So it's this double-edged sword. You know, anybody can create a scare or a scandal just by starting to get the movement going. But it's also a very, very useful way of getting good information quickly to the public. So we're just working with that now. We're just working with that data. It didn't come up in this study because we didn't have, well, Instagram or, or Facebook wasn't really mature enough. People weren't using it enough in, when we were doing this study or those two studies. But it's coming up a lot in the Ireland study. Really interesting. Yeah. And I, I mean, I've got that doubt thing there because I, I do think the opportunity to ask questions which could create doubt about any issue is so possible now. I mean, it's just, it's unprecedented, isn't it? You know, when you see how um, ideas can traverse across large populations very, very quickly, I don't know whether they, the doubt lingers. I don't know how serious that is in terms of people remembering the next day or the next week or whatever what was raised. There's probably some work to do there. Or whether, you know, they just see um, on their iPhone or on their computer and then, you know, 
and it's gone the next day, just because we're saturated in doubt in so many ways. Hi, my name's Cara. Um, I'm a student, um, a master student at the Centre for Food Policy, but I also work for a, a global appliance company um, looking after their recipe database. And we've been on a programme of food safety, and so we've been thinking a lot about where the responsibility lies for safety. And on the question of risk and doubt, I think you can measure risk, but you can't necessarily measure and assess doubt yeah. apart from having a product that is beyond doubt and in terms of where that is in the supply chain the um, if we put too much burden of responsibility on one particular part of the supply chain it seems that they must create a product that's beyond doubt where you then have um, bleached chicken or things that are bleached and sanitised beyond doubt so that they don't cause a problem further down the chain. Um, but the other, th the thing, the, the thought that brings me there is because the only thing that a consumer can do when they're cooking in their own kitchen and cooking at home is rely on the food chain to deliver yeah. food that they can trust, so they have to trust. Mm. And especially if in an age where, where we're entering into an age where a recipe will be digital will be inside an appliance, you then cannot, you, you, the ability to assess the risk or assess the risk of the recipe, etc., is slightly eroded. There's something slightly lost there. Yeah. There's something distance, there's some distance between the consumer and the, the food prep. A small amount, but mm. it is there. Mm. I like what you said about you can measure trust, you can, sorry, risk. Um, but you can't measure doubt, uh, and I think, that's, I think that's the problem. Doubt is this kind of shadow that will linger. Um, going back to the podcast I mentioned, the Andrew Wakefield and the MMR and autism, evidently, um, I think as a consequence of that, in Italy, they tried to introduce a law which, where, where it was mandatory that children were immunised. Um, and a lot of consumer groups said, why are you doing this? Because immunisation carries a risk. It actually carries a risk. And you are introducing that risk to my children by forcing me, by forcing me to immunise my kids. So risk, we know how to minimise it, we know how to articulate it, we can never remove risk. We know it's always going to be there in the food supply. Doubt is something, however, so that was the doubt in the parents' mind, saying, why are you doing this to my child when, I, when, when you know there's a risk? And for most people, measles, mumps and rubella is a pretty kind of, for many people, it's pretty piddly, you know? It okay, so the kids get sick for a little while. Well, actually, no, it's bloody serious. We only think like that because we haven't had epidemics of it. You know, in most people's minds, the, the, the spectre of, of autism, you know, is so much greater than measles, mumps and rubella, you know, so that was why there was that kind of outcry. So I suppose what I'm trying to say is that risk is something we can manage, we have to manage. Doubt is something that's really, really difficult to manage, really, really hard. Once, it, once it's been, it's a part of the genie in the bottle, once it's out, it's almost impossible to put it back because people will remember. Sorry, could you? But possibly in the mind of the, in, when the consumer is making choices, it serves a purpose for them. It may. It may. Rather than to blindly it, trust. It, I guess it depends whether their source of doubt is based on a, a valid experience. If people are doubting something which hasn't got an evidence base or hasn't got some kind of credible element to it, then we've got a problem. Um, so I don't know how things are running here at the moment, but in Australia, wheat has really got bad press. <laughs> People doubt the, health, the healthiness of, of, of wheat and, you know, 
wheat intolerance is almost an epidemic. Um, people believing that the wheat we've got today has been so hybridized by the food industry that we can't digest it. So that's why we have you know, all these health problems. That's why people are doubting wheat. There's no basis for that at all, absolutely none. And yet um, the cloud that hangs over a fairly significant and nutritious uh, group of foods is really important. So if the doubt is kind of misplaced, then I don't know whether it is serving the, the consumer well. I don't know whether that is doing anybody any good. Are you, is that running ragged here as well? People worried about wheat? Yeah? Hi, Sean Buckley from the University of West of England, academic there. Um, it follows on from something that you said earlier and almost relating to something that you've raised. The disconnect with the product, with food, yeah. is I think one of the reasons why there is a lack of trust um, and the reason why in urban areas you see the need for regulation and everything. When there's a disconnect with food, then that's why doubt will come in. The further that someone is removed from the food product, but also it's not just doubt, it's disregard mm. because it's a product that they need to consume and they don't perceive it as being problematic. So even if issues arose, they would still go on and say, I still need to consume this food. Mm. And if people considered where their food came from, I think we would see more doubt mm. and distrust in the food industry. I think people don't appreciate, you know, most of our um, processed meal, uh, me, me, a lot of processed foodstuffs with chicken in. The chicken comes from Thailand. Yeah. A lot of our prawns yeah. come from um, Thai slave ships. And if people actually started thinking about the connection with their food, yeah. would they then have greater doubt? But could we then... Yeah try and create trust yeah. when you have those extensive food supply chains. Yeah, it's a, re it's a really interesting point because the work we've been doing with the island of Ireland, um, when we took the earlier work which said transparency is absolutely key, do we want that level of transparency? <laughs> do we really want that? Um, because it could easily be taken out of context. You know, it's a bit like sausages and government policy. Are there some things that simply should not be witnessed? Um, I don't know. I mean, it, it sounds logical that you would make things transparent so that people could see what's really going on. Do we really want everybody to see what's really going on here? How empowered are we making consumers if we're not giving them the full picture? It may be that chicken from Thailand is even safer than chicken from down the road here. It may be that prawns from Bangladesh are even safer than ones that you can, you know, whatever. But if people don't have that context, just that transparency, are we doing more harm than good? I mean, the transparency is there because they have to, it has to be labelled as coming yeah. from those, but most people wouldn't engage with that information. Yeah. So that's that thing of the information's there, consumers aren't engaging with it at present, yeah. then if you try and be as transparent as possible, does it really make any yeah. difference yeah. until you perhaps have a food scare right. and then it's the misconceptions that can occur yeah. because of those misconceived ideas like the wheat situation that you've got. Yeah, yeah. So when people are tripped up and have to take notice of what might be in the food supply that might be harmful to them, that's when they start reading those labels that you're talking about. And let, yeah, yeah, okay, that works. Hello. Hi. Hi, um, my name is Libby. I'm a graduate student at the Institute of Education at UCL. I'm studying um, food education in particular. And I was just curious about your next study, um, how consumer participants are going to be sampled. Um, I'm curious if the way that... Um, kind of doubt works in food varies, yeah. particularly ac across class, yeah. um, uh, and how kind of food behaviors based on those doubts also kind of translate. I'm not sure if your research focuses on food behaviors yeah. off of doubts, but I'm just curious about that. So we were going to use a 
citizens' democracy process. Do you know about citizens' juries? Do, do they run in? But, yep. So this is where you get uh, people from different cultures, different social groups to make up what is called a citizens' jury. And you, you prime them with information and propositions and they're facilitated to come to some kind of agreement. So that was the way we were going to do that. I don't think we will do that, actually. I think we'll use a, a more familiar method, which is interviews and focus groups, and we will be sampling from various cultures and various social groups in order to get um, a cross-section of people into, into the study. Um, we want to keep this fairly tight because what we want to do is to rather treat it as a, as a pilot study, we don't have that much money, and then go for a larger grant. So if we can get the methodology running, that's why the citizen jury is a bit too risky. I think that that's probably something that might not travel well if we go for a larger sum of money. So we'll probably stick with conventional ways of gathering data. And, but we will be choosing um, people from a, a range of different uh, cultures and a range of different social backgrounds. Was that, Libby, was that your question? Yeah, yeah. So we're pretty good at that. We, we're pretty good at doing that. We have, um, we've used um, companies to help us recruit. Uh, we've done it ourselves. So, we, 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 you know, we've, we've, as you can see from the, the, the publications, we're pretty good at, uh, at, at getting people involved in our research. Yeah. Euro monitor like data yeah. on trust. I mean, I think the interesting thing is we have data from 2003 showing huge confidence in the supermarkets. So what's happened between 2003 and 2000, and, you know, 2016 that that has dipped? So, so the confidence has gone down. Down. They were yeah. number one in 2003, 2005, and now it's gone completely. Natalie here, and then a question. Yeah. Hi. My name is Natalie. Here. Hello, Natalie. Hi. Um, I'm a PhD student here at the centre, and um, sorry, maybe you said this and I missed it, but um, you said that people who don't trust, um, they have riskier behaviour. Yeah. So do you mean by riskier behaviour that they leave out food groups, or what exactly did you mean in this context by riskier behaviour? Uh, usually eating a, a, a range of foods which wouldn't satisfy their nutritional requirements. Okay, yeah. so just leaving out food groups, not yeah. some... Yeah, or following diets that are unsound. Um, the belief that there's a kind of conspiracy that's going on between the government and the food industry, which they're not happy about, so they try to buy out of all of that and, you know, follow, I won't say quacky diets, but follow food regimes that are not very sound just because of their distrust of the regulatory system and the, the food industry and the government. So there's, there's some good papers that have shown that there's, strong correlation there. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Terry Jones from uh, NFU. I also spent a bit of time uh, working with the food industry with the uh, FDF. Um, so I worked on my fair share of um, food scares and, and other bits and pieces. So worked in the food industry during uh, horse meat, worked on um, full of mouth disease and, and avian flu in the um, uh, sort of mid noughties Now, um, I was really taken by the idea of trying to model uh, the, the the problem and, and, and sort of find, find a way through it. Um, and you, you asked about whether you know can you do it, and, and or is it entirely dependent on the context? And someone else talked about um, lingering doubt. The question I'd got was really about worsening doubt and the sort of uh, life cycle of the uh, of the scandal or the problem. Um, so my experience has very much been one of uh, so something happens, and people are, you know immediately um, that their their trust in the system is uh, is dented. But you then kind of go on a bit of a roller coaster ride where the questions very quickly outpace the answers, yeah. depending on what the issue yeah. is. So in horse meat, the, the questions were around: is this a, a public health problem? Uh, how widespread is the problem? Who's to blame? 
uh, and the questions pile up and the industry yeah. and government yeah. um, can't answer them at yeah. the speed that they're generated and of course the speed of the generation quickens with the advent of social media yeah. uh, and, and so on. So I guess the question is, you know, given that we have this, this, this I suppose, roller coaster, and you can, uh, it can be, you can, you can dent trust to, or sow the seeds of doubt to such an extent that to, to pull out and yeah. come out the other side, yeah. uh, it's what is whether in designing the, the model, whether you can kind of take into account the, the extent to which you completely hammer trust. Uh, and you may never uh, recover, or it, you, it just takes so long uh, that, that it's actually very difficult to, to model and, and conceive of how yeah. you, you could do it. And I just wondered if you could speak to that point. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that worries me about our work is that it relies so much on what I call say-do. You know, people say what they would do. Um, under these circumstances, what would, you, what would you do? And then people tell you what they do. It would be really good to have a do-do. <laughs> uh, so what I mean by that is if there was um, an opportunity to actually see how you managed a real-life food scare or food scandal using our model, our protocol, that would be so much better than, you know, what would happen if. You see what I mean? Um, but we can't. We can't manufacture one, perhaps we could, um, but it would be really great to be able to test that. Now, funnily enough, while we were conducting the Island of Ireland work, the horse meat scandal was running here, wasn't it, Martin? And because uh, Martin was involved in the in the study, and it, that was really interesting because they, the the journalists, especially that we spoke to, talked about the way that they were trying to manage that the difficulty in getting their claws into it because it wasn't on the surface a health problem it was an integrity problem and making a story out of integrity is so more so much more difficult than making a story out of poison you know the public might not be terribly interested in you know food integrity they said it was this had this and it didn't, it had that. Well, yeah, but what was the health con Well, there wasn't a health consequence. Actually, it may have been that horse meat is more nutritious than cow's meat, but let's not go there. So that's one of the problem. that was one of the problems uh, in that study, but it wasn't a problem, it was quite interesting. We're actually writing a paper around that. But this idea that you, you know, how, how quickly do you come out of it? I don't know. All we can do is speculate because people will say, oh, if you do this and you do this, that's the quickest way of turning it around. If you don't do that, you have the lingering doubt that Tony talked about with the, you know, the meat being uh, relabeled. Um, because if there are no real facts coming through, you're going to get manufactured facts that will continue to haunt the situation until the real facts turn up. And that's a, that's a problem. So my concern with all of this work, coming back to the top, is that a lot, so much of it depends on speculation. What would you do if? But actually seeing what people did under um, real life circumstances would be, would be terrific. But these kind of protocols, you know, they're there in many other cases of emergency. You know, like if the alarm bells went off now, uh, the fire alarm, we would probably get instructions to go here, go there. People would come out with their, you know, their do you have those fire, fire wardens here? We've all got one on Africa. So that we know what to do under those circumstances. This first, this second, this third. There's many, many other emergency circumstances have been distilled down to particular steps to keep people safe. Is it possible to do that under these circumstances? Or is the building or damaging of trust so contextualised that each one is going to be quite different and therefore has to be responded to differently. I don't know the answer to that. Hi. Um, so my name is Rabia and I'm a former master's student from the Erasmus University, Rotterdam. Um, I wrote uh, my thesis on uh, how cities can help reduce meat consumption um, and uh, went through my interviews with experts in a lot of those categories you did your research in. Um, meat scan 
meat scandals were a major um, contributor to people moving towards lower meat diets or becoming vegan or vegetarian. Uh, so going back to your yeah. earlier, the, yeah, I just wanted to know if those kinds of diets are included in um, the quote unquote negative um, unfounded diets. Um, yeah. they, they, they can be. Okay. Um, especially in relation to children's needs. So they can be quite risky. Um, yeah, vegan diets, diets that are marginal in certain nutrients um, can be quite risky for certain groups. Um, I've got first-hand knowledge of that. I used to be a dietitian in a children's hospital. Right. And every so often we used to admit kids with who were malnourished. Every so often we would admit kids with B12 deficiency, mm -hmm. which is really, really sad because it's very hard to reverse that. Right. You know, it causes neurological damage. Very, very hard. So mm -hmm. risk, I'm not saying that it's widespread. Mm -hmm. just saying that we do know there's a relationship between people who distrust the food supply and practice risky health right. Um, and eating behaviors. Right, so in, in, in sorry, as a follow-up question, um, what would be a positive outcome of managing a crisis? Well, so is it to have people return to their original uh, dietary patterns or use the opportunity to move towards more healthy and climate-friendly diets? But that would be the same thing for me. I mean, that's all part of the same package. You know, moving towards healthy, sustainable mm -hmm. diets is what we're, trying, it's what we're promoting the whole of the time. Um, okay. Whether we would do it in times of food scares and scandals, you know, we should be doing that anyway, shouldn't we? No, I totally agree, yeah. but those are great moments uh, with, like where yeah. you have people's yeah. attention yeah. 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 and it's been kind of proven that after that, the, like after those kind of dips in trust, you can, if you do the right things, you can have people pay more attention. So to your earlier point. That's right. Yeah. It, yeah. It's so, a, cr a trigger for people to pay attention to their eating habits. Right. So, so I guess it's, is it that if you manage it well, you can have more positive outcomes? Because right now we eat a lot of processed foods and excess meat and less vegetables, et cetera. So if we were to use these opportunities, could we have changes in diets that then are more positive as opposed to... So perhaps more people eating yeah. organic food or something like that because they want to put trust in that side of right. the food system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say the most important uh, outcome for, the, for this is to give people mm -hmm. confidence to actually go right. back to eating what they were eating. I mean, that's got to be the first mm -hmm. step, you know, feel comfortable in eating what you normally eat. Whether they start to eat something that's organic or, or whatever, I mean, that might be part of another process. But I would say the most important successful outcome would be returning quickly to what we were eating in the first place. But it can be a trigger for people to expect their eating habits. Okay. Are we eating too much meat, for example? Gotcha. Thank you. Further questions, comments? You didn't introduce who you were the last time. Oh, sorry. Uh, um, I'm uh, Luke, I work, um, study here at um, City University on the Master's Programme. I also work for the Department for Environment, Food and Agriculture and do some stuff around trust. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, I was wondering about the role of, uh, you, you spoke to um, policy makers in your research, you spoke to, and um, you're going to be speaking to... You might want to pull that closer. A little bit closer. closer. I was just thinking about the role of um, NGOs as arbiters of trust. Um, now and used to be kind of on the side of sort of campaign mm. campaigning around mm. food issues but now have been brought into kind of the, the labeling and the transparency side of things I don't mm. know whether you had any insight on that, well, that well, kind of, give me some examples of some NGOs uh, well now we have I think the RSPCA now do an assurance scheme yeah. here uh, across a load of different um, food products, as do um, the Soil Association. Mm. I think you've also got mm. um, various seafood ones as well, if you mm. accreditations, and you're seeing more and more come into that mm. space. Um, I was just wondering around sort of trust in NGOs, I think is quite high in this country, yeah. especially around food. How interesting. Um, and their role in sort of fostering yeah. trust. Yeah. I know someone touched earlier, yeah. people don't really look at the Sounds like they've got a voice as well. Yeah. 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 I don't know, no, we have that up in your, yeah. in your Australian research. We, we in, in the studies I've showed you, we didn't talk to, to NGOs, but if we wrap that into kind of consumer groups yeah. or groups that represent consumers, then they'll certainly be part of the next round of our, of our study, which is taking back this model and asking, what do you think? Can you give us some feedback? Yeah. 
So I can't ask you a question now, but I hope to when we've done the study. Yeah. Um, Kate Smith, I'm working with Slow Food in the UK. I've recently moved from Australia, so I have an understanding of, uh, I'm learning to have an understanding of where, where food policy is in, in the UK. And I'm interested to find out whether or not, I don't believe that Australians have that same trust in those con NGOs mm. that it is obvious in the UK they mm. have a really big voice mm. a, amongst consumers who want to know mm. more. Um, would that be something that you'd be able to look, you would include in looking at, is where those, tr why we don't have that trust in Australian society in those NGOs? Um, um, I'm interested to know why that is such a credible body in this country compared to Australia. It may be a product of the evisceration of government uh, some years ago and a lot, of, a lot of government bodies just disappearing. I mean, I'm talking about Thatcher and all of that. Where, um, And actually, Tim Lang's got a very good paper. It's a book chapter, I think, on this. As the government shrank and its responsibilities evaporated, where were people going to get information? So you've got all these... NGOs that people went to because the government simply wasn't doing that. Um, or if it was, it wasn't doing it in ways that people wanted. I don't think we've had that level of shrinkage in Australia. I think for Zans, even though people didn't know what it was called, still holds quite a lot of prestige as a source of information and a source of credibility. So I don't think people have had to go to those other organisations for that level of information. Um, I'm speculating now, but that, that's kind of my theory, because we, we didn't shrink government in quite the same way that, that the UK did. And there were still those bodies that were credible sources of advice and information. But it's, 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 it's interesting that New Zealand, that out Thatcher Thatcher, I have to tell you, in shrinking government, does have NGOs that people turn to and go to, um, perhaps a bit like this country. Yeah, yeah, I've worked with some of them. Very interesting. So I think it might be a product of what I've just said. Oh. Hello. Uh, so I'm Grace. I work for the Anaphylaxis Campaign, which is a charity for people with severe allergies. Um, and we communicate product alerts when a product has been recalled because it contains an allergen that's not labelled. Um, and just sort of, it's not really a question, but more of a comment. Um, when a food company is more transparent and we communicate that with our members, they don't really like it. Um, and I find that really bizarre. I always think that people want as much information as possible. Um, and I'm just wondering how can, because we try and be the broker between the industry and the allergic yeah. community. And I always, it was always my opinion that they would want as much information as possible because I want to know why the issue occurred. And I would think that some people want that information and some really shy away from it. Do you, can you offer any insight into I'm that? Just, uh, great. So what do they say? What don't they like about it? Um, they don't like hearing about how the industry works particularly. They don't want to know that a product is being produced on the same line as another product. Mm. They, they don't want that information, mm. maybe because they don't want it to exist, you know, they don't want it to happen that way. Mm. Um, and yeah, I mean, behavioural psychology tells us that when people know something is not good for them, they then have to change their habits. Mm. And they don't like doing that. <laughs> People don't like changing something that might be difficult to change for them. So that might be one of the reasons why they don't want to hear this, you know, because if I know this, I'm going to have to change what I'm doing at the moment. I just don't have time in my life to do that. That may be kind of one of the reasons. But it'd be an interesting thing to explore. Um, why is it that people, you know, behave like that with that knowledge? Because we do think that knowledge is power. 
and if you know this, then you can make informed decisions. Um, well, perhaps some people don't really want to make informed decisions. They'd rather do what they like to do on a daily basis, even though it's uninformed. Thank you very much. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know why people do that. But it's something we can bring up when we're doing this next round of, uh, of, of research. Yeah. Um, so I have one more um, so you, you said earlier that after a scandal, the goal is for people to return to trust, as, or to trust and return to their behavior as fast yeah. as possible. But isn't this kind of, wouldn't that be a good time for doubt and to kind of, you know, see that as a result of the food system and, and kind of not yeah. return to trust, but start doubting of yeah. what is going on? Yeah. And then what's the consequence of that? Action? I don't know. Mm. Using that as an opportunity to change people in a planned way is different from reacting to it in a crisis, I would think. I think John's point is you really okay. get people to return to their feeling safe to, to consume chicken again. Yeah. 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 After that. Uh, I, I take your point. We could look at it. How do you change behavior? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, can't hear. That was a really interesting talk and a really interesting debate going on. Um, my name's Jill. I'm a public health nutritionist. used to work with Martin a long time ago near that cupboard, and that just made me laugh when you said that. Um, Tim, and, Tim and his um, reduced spaces <laughs> in Ealing. Um, but my question is around this idea of trust and the health professionals, because obviously as public health nutritionists, we look to the evidence base, usually yeah. from Public Health England yeah. or NICE guidance, before we communicate any updated information yeah. to the families we work with. And it was interesting to see in your study that majority of people were trusting the farmers. Yeah. So was that because they perceived them to be closer to the food issues? And also, why don't people trust health professionals what do you think the barriers might be there i'll deal with the farmer one first yeah um <laughs> uh, come back to what i said earlier i think australia um, and new zealand have such admiration for for the farming industry um you know it's really easy uh, where I live and work, to find somebody who has relatives still on the farm. Right. Very, very easy. Right. Um, I'm, I'm not saying they're hobby farmers. They're actually serious farmers. Mm. So you're usually two steps removed from somebody who actually produces food. Right. You know? right. And I think that that, and, and, and I think that Australians have this love of, of rurality, love of agriculture. Most cities in Australia, all of them actually, every year have the agricultural show. So this is a seven-day event. Uh, somebody from Melbourne will... Sorry, did you come from Melbourne? I sit in both sides of Sydney and Melbourne. So, <laughs> so, so the Royal Easter Show, I think it is in Sydney, isn't it? Where, you know, you, you go and you watch cows being milked and there are, you know, judging the various cattle and sheep and all of that. So this one week a year when we become really rural, uh, very educational for kids, and the rest of the year, you know, we do what we carry on. So it's this kind of love affair, I think, with, with the farming sector, which I think is different. I believe that's different in Europe. I don't think there's the same connections there. Um, you know, this is me speculating, but I just don't think they're the same. Well, it shows that farmers were not as trusted as in those other jurisdictions as they are in Australia. Um, those other jurisdictions, farmers came very low down the, the trust spectrum. So I don't know whether that's because people feel uncomfortable about farmers. I mean, you know, why would you we'll listen to the archers, don't we? I mean, that's a <laughs> good farming community. Um, so I, I, it's, it's a very interesting point for me, the way that Australians do seem to connect with 
uh, the rural, the agricultural sector, and I think our data was showing that. Oh, is that right? And the health issue? The health issue. Yeah. Well, I, I, I don't know whether they don't trust health professionals. Um, I don't know the data here, but perhaps it's the way the studies are carried out in Australia. Um, there does seem to be a lot of trust in, in health professionals. Um, so I cannot see your question. I don't know why it would be the case. But there isn't, you're telling me there's, there's little trust in health professionals in the UK? Um, I think people get their information from so many different sources. Yeah. So the, the media um, picks up a lot of things yeah. and, and it can sl be slightly distorted. And I just usually point people to the, the NHS website. There's a, a behind the headlines where it de debunks all the myths yeah. of what you find in the papers. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just in, I just find it all interesting. This whole trust issue and where people get their information. Yeah. And on the one hand, we're told you know it has to be evidence-based information to gain that trust. But on the other, like you were saying, that people don't want to hear yeah. it either. Yeah. It's I mean, a kind of level of information. Evidence-based discourse is very professional. Yeah. Isn't it? I yeah. Mean, yeah. You know, yeah. Um, of course. We love to rehearse that, but yeah, yeah. people on the streets just no. perhaps want to hear what they want to hear. Yeah, bite-sized pieces yeah. of that. Yeah. 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 But coming back to Australia, I mean, in my own sector, uh, dietitians and the Dietitians Association of Australia usually comes out tops in terms of, and it may be just the way the questions are asked, you know, mm -hmm. who of these people do you trust most? They usually come out fairly high when it comes to trustworthiness. Uh, much more than, um, than GPs, on the, on the question of diet, much more than GPs and, and naturopaths and people like that. They're usually pretty high up the scale. Okay. But trust sources of information might be... It might be different, yeah. Yeah. Do you go to your individual dietitian for that information? Well, probably not, Martin. You probably don't go to your individual dietitian for sort of general dietary advice. You probably find that on the web somewhere. Hi, just, uh, sorry, I'm Hannah from Good Food Oxford. Just following on from a couple of the difficult questions um, about what's actually the purpose of rebuilding trust when we have a, a, a food system that's kind of decreasing in terms of functionality, you know, in terms of health disbenefits, environmental disbenefits. Isn't there an opportunity there to build participation, Absolutely. citizenship? Uh, you know, people saying, well, what can we do about X? And individual behaviour change models say that after a health scare, that's when people change their behaviour, um, you know, in terms of addiction and, and yeah. um, obesity, things like that. So, you know, is there a responsibility there in terms of, you know, a wider society? Who's the organisation or the person that should be stewarding that risky behaviour after a health scare yeah. so that it is able to be more climate positive and more health positive? And, you know, can you actually curate that role for health professionals and NGOs in a, in a closer way? Um, you know, are there more actors here that we need to pay attention to in order to kind of push pro-social, pro-environmental behaviour? Yeah. And your question is? So are there more actors that need to be considered? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. You know, we're talking about health yeah, professionals. Yeah, sure, so sure, sure, sure. I mean, uh, I think your early question also was, what's the point of rebuilding trust in a food system that appears to be deteriorating? Would, I, would that be fair enough? Is that what you said? Yeah, and not just for that food scare, but, you know, no, from a health and yeah. environmental point of view. And, and I'll, I would question that. I would question that, where, whether our food supply is deteriorating. What evidence is there for that? Uh, Tim Lang speaks very well about it. <laughs> that year on year, we've got a food supply that's decreasing in what? And increasing in what? I mean, I, I actually, you know, I actually have a problem with that. But perhaps I'm in the wrong jurisdiction. Perhaps I'm speaking from an Australian perspective. Because I think that if you look 10, 20 years ago, what we've got today is pretty bloody good. 
you know, it's pretty good in comparison to what was there um, 10, 15, 20 years ago, and probably safer in many ways. So I don't know whether we're part of the same discussion here. Climate change? Yeah. Well, yes. Yeah, okay. I mean, I, I get that. So, it's yeah, it's a big one. Okay. It's so, making so a contribution to that. No, I, 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 I certainly accept that. But if we're talking about the quality and the availability of food and even the affordability of food. Maybe so, but I don't think you can just say, okay, we can have these things, but not. And forget about the climate change okay, okay. and the environment. No, I, 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 I take that but point. But since on, I've got this, can I ask a take question? That point. <laughs> I absolutely take that point on board. But does it, will a food scare over salmonella do anything about that? Well, I guess that's my question. I think that there's an interesting question about individual behaviour change versus you know, societal change and whether you can follow the same models that when people have a scare as an individual, a health scare, and they end up in, in hospital, for example, they change their behavior. We know that as a society, our, our behavior is risky in terms of the climate and in terms of, you know, malnutrition yeah. and obesity. Yeah. Is there a, societal, a, a spur for societal change as well from a food scare? But the, the, the change in behaviour is usually part of a prescribed program, isn't it? It's usually part of a, here's what to do next, here's what to do after that, and here's what to do, you know, thirdly. So without that, I think leaving distrust to run riot, I think that's actually quite damaging. Well, exactly. So is there a role there? Do we have a responsibility or... Is it playing God to, to put together prescribed programs that help people to kind of change their behavior as a result of food scares? So within our model, should we have another element which says, as well as having protocols, as well as being proactive, as well as being transparent, use this as a time to introduce arguments about X, Y, and Z. C citizenship, for example, developing yeah. citizenship. Yeah. Well, that's a good point, isn't it? Active citizenship as part of the overall model. What a good idea. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Yes, uh, sorry, I'm Lindy Sharp, and I'm a, a research uh, fellow in the Centre for Food Policy. Um, I, it's fascinating to listen to this and I'm just sitting listening I'm just wondering whether actually haven't you written a book about governmentality yeah yeah so you're just a man to answer this isn't part of the whole individuation individualization of our culture and um, <clears throat> is is trust itself actually discredited the thing we don't we don't want to trust because we've been taught to not trust external things but to um, judge everything for ourselves. Is it, is it about control and, yeah, you know, and yeah. remember, I'm remembering that excellent phone called The Merchants of Doubt, which I'm sure you're familiar yeah, with. Yeah. Um, so that's it, really. How does, how does this fit in with technologies of control? Yeah. Um, Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> I think, I think, uh, <laughs> <laughs> trust became enormously interesting for sociologists about 10 years ago they kind of discovered trust as a human characteristic so you know you have Nicholas Luhmann talking about it you have Anthony Giddens talking about it as a feature of modern society we simply have to trust it's something that we it's because we can't do everything ourselves when we could do that we didn't have to trust we could do you know whatever it needed to take to live. But once you move out of that and you specialise and other people are doing the work that you used to do, you have to have a trust building and bonding relationship as part of being a cooperative community. You won't get a cooperative community if there is large amounts of distrust. So we have, this is the sociologist view, we have developed a sense of the need for trust by virtue of the way our lives have become very specialised and us not being able to cover everything that's necessary. Now, I think that holds water. 
in terms of governmentality, I'm thinking that you can exploit trust by creating goals that people are expected to attain and trust us, we will be the ones who will take you towards those goals. So I think the governmentality is not really a trust question. I think, I think the, the trust question is about cooperation, collaboration and a sense of being together. I don't know whether governmentality, I can lay a, a layer of governmentality over that very easily. You can't? Perhaps I'm not being imaginative. <laughs> I'll have to give it some thought. Okay, thank you. Time, sorry. Time is up, so, but John will be around for a couple of moments if you want yeah. to grab him and talk to him. I'm going to whisk him away in about 20 minutes, so make use of that. Thank you all for coming. Can we put our hands together for John and thank you? Thank you very much. He just got off a plane yesterday, so he's still jet-lagged, so thank you. Thank you, John. A pleasure, as always. The video the, the, it will be online in about a week's time, so you tell your colleagues who haven't been able to make it that it will all be available online as well on the, on the website. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming on a cold um, evening like this evening.